Hello everyone and welcome to Robotics Today. My name is Luca Carlone and I'm very excited to introduce Anka Dragan as our speaker today. Before introducing Anka, I wanted to restate our support as organizer of Robotics Today towards the protesters who are manifesting against systemic racism and racial injustice in the United States and around the world. I want every member of this community to know unequivocally where we stand and to feel included and supported. We have observed the shutdown STEM and shutdown academy initiatives last Wednesday, and we hope this can be the beginning of a real change. In this deeply troubled moment, we want to assert that Black Lives Matter and acknowledge that systemic racism is reducing opportunities to succeed for people of color. We are planning concrete action within this seminar series to increase diversity, broaden participation, and elevate and diversify voices in the robotics community. While we plan to announce some of these actions during our next seminar, I wanted to take this opportunity to invite you to support organizations like Black Girls Code, Black in AI, and AI for All through donation, mentorship, and local outreach events. We also invite you to highlight the technical contribution of Black people in STEM by using the Amplify Black STEM hashtag and to specifically include links to publish work led by Black people using the Side Black STEM hashtag. Finally, we encourage you to uh, provide feedback and inputs. Please do not hesitate to reach out to any of us and use the form on the Robotics Today website to share ideas. So with these words, I would like to now introduce this week's speaker. Anka Dragan is an assistant professor in the ECS department at UC Berkeley, where she runs the Interact Lab that focuses on algorithms for human-robot interaction. Hanka has made a number of fundamental contributions towards distilling complicated human behavior into simple mathematical models that robots can understand. A main source of conflicts when robots and humans interact is the lack of transparency about each other's intentions. Hanka tries to solve these conflicts through a combination of optimal control, learning, planning, estimation, and cognitive science. Solving this conflict is crucial for many applications for Assistive, assistive robots to manufacturing and autonomous cars. Anka's huge impact on the research community and society has been acknowledged by multiple awards. I could probably spend most part of this hour to list them all, but I will limit myself to mentioning a few. So she got the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, the NSF Career Award, the MIT Tech Review 35 Innovators Under 35 in 2017, the ONR Young Investigator Award, and the HRI 2020 Best Paper Award. Besides being an exemplary researcher, Hank has been a driving force behind several initiatives. For instance, she helped found the Berkeley AI Research Lab, and uh, she founded the AI for All Bear Camp at UC Berkeley, which is a summer camp on human-centered AI for high school students from low-income backgrounds. This has been done in collaboration with the AI for All organization that I mentioned before. So without further ado, I would like to leave the stage to Anka Dragan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luca. Thanks for organizing this. This is so great. Um, and thanks for giving me a chance to talk a little bit about the things that uh, you know bring me joy in research. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. And you can uh, just double check for me that everything looks OK. How is that? Perfect. All right. Um, yeah, so welcome, everyone. Um, I, um, I'm i going to share a little bit with you um, on the topic of optimizing intended reward functions, getting our robots to do that. Um, so I work on many kinds of robots. Like you were saying, I, I work on autonomous cars and indoor mobile robots and quad orders and manipulator arms. And traditionally, my work focuses on how to get them to achieve their objectives when they're not alone in the world, but they need to actually coordinate and collaborate with people, with us humans. And it turns out that a major bottleneck to do that well is actually being able to define what the robot's objective is in the first place before you can talk about how to do that well around people. And so let me share um, an example of that. When I got to Berkeley, I started working on autonomous driving. And um, the first thing I noticed is that autonomous cars tend to be pretty conservative. So if uh, this orange car here is the autonomous car and it needs to get into the left lane, uh, if I tell it to maximize efficiency, of course, also avoid collisions and stay on the road, obey traffic rules and so on. If I tell it to maximize efficiency, the car 
won't be able to do very well. Um, so it will predict what the human in the white car will uh, plans on doing, and it just go forward. And then it will have to slow down and march behind the human in order to not get in the person's way and avoid collisions with it. So it will do that if there's no one else coming. But if there's someone else coming, it will wait for them to go. And then someone else comes and they will wait for them to go. And so kind of the car either gets stuck uh, waiting or it until a big enough gap in traffic happens or it just misses the the merge um, altogether and somehow when we humans are placed in the same position we magically invent the third option so we in that same situation at some point we're done waiting and we just kind of nudge ourselves into that target lane and rely on the car behind to decelerate a little and make give us a bit of room um, so we worked hard in kind of in the beginning of my, of my, uh, life at Berkeley, we worked hard to give cars and robots more generally kind of the same understanding of the influence that they can have through their actions on what the people around do. And then we thought that, the, that we can model interaction mathematically as an under-actuated system. The idea was that you don't directly control human actions, don't have actuator on the human degree of freedom, but you can influence through your actions. And so we worked on that. Um, and uh, now robots could you know, figure out how to kind of negotiate these things with you. But there's a flip side. So, if the car now can gain just a tiny bit in efficiency, it has no problem cutting you off and forcing you to decelerate at you know, seven meters per second squared. So this kind of became now a, uh, what I call a reward function problem. So the car is, becomes aggressive. It understands that it can influence your actions, but maybe it's using that influence a little too much. Um, and what we realized is that we can't just optimize for our own car's efficiency. We actually want to also optimize for not being jerks to other people, right? So we want to also optimize for their efficiency. So we added this courtesy term as part of the objective. Um, and so far, so good. It improved some things on highway driving. And then we looked at some point at a four-way stop situation. And what does the car do? Well, um, it doesn't go. It doesn't even stay there and wait for you to go. Instead, it decides to take matters into its hands an inch backwards from the intersection. Basically, back up because that incentivizes the human to go faster through the intersection, which is great for courtesy. So um, this, it turns out, not a problem for the, the other car. We did some user studies, people went faster through the intersection and remarkably actually worked out. But so no problems there, but here's the thing. If there's someone behind, or if there's a passenger in the car, um, then all of a sudden the person, that person's freaking out wondering, why is my car backing up at the intersection, right? So the objective is still missing pieces, right? Maybe we're prioritizing courtesy too much, but we're also missing things like comfort and intent expressiveness. Can people understand what's going on? Um, and so on. And so I think we're getting good at taking task specifications. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about specifically rewards in this talk as kind of a general framework for, for objectives or task specifications, but you can also think about goals or constraints or whatever sort of your method of choice for specifying um, you know, the objective of a decision-making system is. So we're getting pretty good at taking those task specifications and turning them autonomously into behavior, you know, via search, via optimization, via reinforcement learning, um, satisficing, uh, and so on and so But what we often kind of sweep under the rug is just how hard it is to write down that task specification to begin with. So how do you, whoops, sorry, one second. Um, how do you capture um, things like comfort in an autonomous car? Or how do you trade off between safety and efficiency and not crossing the double yellow line and stopping and so on? 
Uh, and we sometimes think that constraints will magically solve this, but they don't. You know, constraints are just as bad. Like we use, we have to decide on a threshold on the probability of a collision and how do you decide on that and what happens when you can't both meet the safety threshold and not cross the double yellow line and so on. So that specification tends to be pretty tricky. This was an example from autonomous driving. There's, I have plenty more where that came from in other in other domains um, that I've looked at, but um, actually found a really interesting example um, from OpenAI as well. So this is a boat racing game, and um, what happens here is there's a DeepRL agent who's trained to um, race in this game, and as you can see, this is the the boat in white here. It's not doing a very good job at uh, said racing. Um, it's just kind of doing this weird loop behavior. And you look at this and you might think, oh, there must be some bug and the policy learning. But it turns out, no, actually, the policy is fantastic. So what the, the boat figures out is to do this loop. And at times, it just right that it collects these turbo boosters in green when they show up. And each turbo booster gives it, I don't know, like a 1,000 points. And the boat, the reward specified was score in the game, number of points in the game. And so the boat is like, well, you know, why, uh, racing is hard, winning is hard. Why do all that when I can collect a bazillion points this way? Um, and so that, that's what it does. And it's hard to anticipate this sort of behavior coming, uh, coming out. Um, so overall, I think the problem stems from the fact that we kind of, in AI and robotics, we tend to uh, lie a little bit to ourselves. We pretend like the AI problem is you have an agent and there's a state space and the agent can take actions that affect that state. And there's some reward function that falls from the sky somehow. And the problem definition is find a policy that maximizes that reward function cumulatively in expectation. And uh, we do this because it's a way to make progress on concrete problems and that's great. But Unfortunately, that's not quite what the real problem is, right? In, in, in reality, yes, there's an agent, there's states, there's actions, and then there's a human. And the human wants something, and the agent's job is to do that something, <laughs> to do what the person actually, actually wants. Um, so I, I teach intro to AI at Berkeley, and I tell the students, look, here's what AI is. It's optimizing the specified reward. Um, and you know, being able to do a good job at that. But it, I think it's actually not that. It's actually optimized the, what I'm gonna call the intended reward. The, the thing that people actually want the robot to do, even though sometimes that's not exactly what they specify, like it wasn't in these examples that we've been talking through. So what does it mean to optimize intended reward. Let's try to make this a little bit more concrete. So in this talk, we're going to represent the reward function as uh, in, in, in some parametric space. So it could be linear combination of features, um, an important criteria that we know we care about, or it could be a deep neural network that takes state and action as input and spits out a scalar. So we're going to call whatever the parameterization is, we're going to call those ways, those parameters theta in this talk. And what's hard about um, essentially the, the robot has to optimize the reward function, try to optimize the reward function induced by theta without really knowing what theta is. It doesn't get to directly observe theta. So instead it has to have uncertainty over what the right theta is. Try to estimate that theta somehow, work with the person to figure it out. So that's kind of the framework that, uh, that uh, we've been building towards. And when you look at it from that perspective of optimizing this intended reward and keeping this uncertainty, if you think about what we currently do by default, it goes something like this. The human gives the robot their best guess at a theta. We're going to call that theta tilde. And as we saw in the boat and in the car examples, that theta tilde might not be exactly the right theta might not correspond, might not induce the behavior that the person actually wants everywhere. So there might be this discrepancy between theta tilde and, and, and the theta that the robot should actually be optimizing for. But we do our, we know, we, we give it our best shot. Um, we engineer this theta tilde. And now what does the robot do? Well, the robot treats this, 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 this thing that we spewed out as 
ground truth as defining theta. So it treats us almost like we're some sort of, it has some sort of perfect sensor. So when, then when, when we say theta tilde, bam, that is the definition of theta. So it, it's, it's sort of automatically shifting all probability mass on, ah, you said theta tilde, that must be it, done. Um, zero on everything else, right? And in reality, maybe we're not magic oracles. We're also human, us, the, the engineers designing these systems, whether in labs or, or, uh, or in companies. We're people, and so uh, this specification that we come up with, it might not actually be perfect, so maybe the robot shouldn't interpret it as being perfect. Um, and then, so, so, but that's, well, that's, that's the default, right? We just, we, we say, look, probability one, this is the data. And then on the other hand, on the flip side, um, if we, if we deploy the robot, there's other things that we'll end up doing that the, the robot is not using to kind of update its understanding in any way. So here's an example of this that I like. Um, so let's say I deploy the robot. What does the robot do? Well, it will optimize this reward function that the designer specified. So here is a robot program to trade off efficiency with maximizing distances from obstacles like the table. And imagine it's in my home. It's not, it's in my old lab right now, but, but uh, imagine it's in my, this isn't happening in my home and it's doing this, the, it, it's moving in the context of, help me unload the dishwasher, um, which let me tell you, I have done more of in, during this quarantine than cumulatively throughout all of my life combined. Uh, Gosh, has there been a lot of dishwasher loading and unloading? Um, so anyway, so imagine, you know, my dream is like, I actually have a robot that helps out with that. Uh, so I look at what the robot does. I look at how the robot is moving. And maybe I get a little bit worried because it's keeping this mug that it's carrying very high off the ground. And I worry that it might, it might, drop it and then it might shatter. So in that moment of worry, what can I do? Well, one natural thing that I might just react with is as the robot moves, I just push it closer to the ground, right? I just intervene and I'm like, oh God, robot, you have to be closer to the ground. Um, so th that's a pretty natural reaction. Um, uh, the question, so this is kind of an, a reaction in the moment for me, maybe, but I'd argue that it's actually also very good information about the reward, right? Because whatever the robot is optimizing for currently must be wrong if it required me to intervene. So I might not mean it as a, let me teach you about the reward function robot, right? I might just react this way, but it, it, meaning it or not, I end up communicating implicitly to the robot that look, whatever you're optimizing for, probably not the right thing to optimize for. Now, what does the robot do? Um, well, the robot behaves compliantly, right? Depending on what controller you're running. We were running an impedance controller here. Um, but the moment I now let go, the robot just goes back to doing the task in the way it thinks is optimal, right? And because the designer told it, look, maximize distances from table and all of that, um, it just it goes back to doing that. And so while optimizing the specified reward, I think makes a lot of sense, when you think about it from this lens of we need to optimize intended reward, we can kind of see that these agents tend to infer too much or learn too much from the stuff that we specify, and maybe too little from everything else that's gonna happen in their existence. <laughs> um, where for example, one source of information, there, there's a lot of information that we're perhaps leaving on the table. Um, and it turns out we leave on the table a lot more than, than we might think. So um, people might physically correct the, the robot, push it away from them, push it closer to something, uh, the robot gets too close. And, um, and that's one example. They might say stuff in natural language, which I think we do, do quite a bit of research on being able to interpret that. Um, but like I might tell the robot, uh, no, don't, you know, this is too close or it might chatter or something like that. I might react that way. Um, uh, and there's more. So imagine that the robot is about to go through a puddle of water and you see this and you panic and you switch it off, right? Again, I'd argue that that's very useful information about 
the reward, right? Even if all the person was thinking about was stopping you right now so that you don't go into the water, they gave you really this really valuable piece of information. You should figure out from this that probably generally it's a bad idea to go into the water. You should have a better idea of what to do now from this day, go around the water rather than um, you know go through it. So um, they didn't tell you all this, but by just the sheer effect of panicking and switching you off, you should be able to figure some of this out. Um, there's one more example that I want to give of this um, sort of implicit information, uh, and it's probably my favorite one. So it goes something like this. Imagine that someone tells you to clean up a room, and you go into this room, and you see this beautifully assembled house of cards. I would bet that even though the person didn't literally say, clean up the room, but don't clean up the house of cards, any one of us would leave the house of cards untouched, right? Um, the person didn't have to say it, but somehow the existence of the house of cards itself is already evidence that the human cares about it and doesn't want to destroy it. So I think there's evidence, even in our environments, about what it is that we actually want, what this intended reward is. Um, so, through what we do, through what we say, even how we set up our environment, we end up leaking information about what we want, um, that, the that what we want the robot to optimize for. And this information um, can fill in the blanks of what we maybe forgot to specify ahead of time. The question is, how do we enable robots to kind of extract this link <laughs> and, and use it towards um, actually updating its understanding, uh, updating this belief it has over theta. So in other words, how do we go from observing the feedback to a belief update on theta? Um, and what's hard about this is that we need to kind of arm the robot with what we might call an observation model or a human model, right? It needs to get a sense of, well, what is given, given a particular thing that you want, what would this feedback look like? What would you do? What would you say? When would you search, switch it off, et cetera? And so um, the question is, OK, how do we end up doing this, giving the robot such a model, and give the robot such a model that kind of works for this huge diversity of information that people end up essentially leaking, um, as well as the stuff that we say on purpose, like the specified reward. And so now that I think we're kind of on the same page about what the problem setup is, have uncertainty about the reward, use human feedback of various sources to learn about what the reward is, what I want to do for um, the rest of our time together is first talk about explicitly, specifically, the special case of a specified reward as the feedback that you're receiving, as the evidence. And then towards the end of the talk, kind of pop back up to all these other types of feedback and see how we might generalize what we do for rewards to the rest. OK, so when you specify a reward for your robot, what does it mean for the robot? Uh, what does it mean essentially for, for that the reward you specify is not the definition, but is merely evidence about what the robot should actually optimize. How do we mathematically capture this process that makes you, as a designer, not actually end up with the right theta? Like, what's the difference between the theta that you want implicitly somehow and this proxy, this theta tilde that you end up specifying? Um, and it's not that you can just take your true, uh, your true like theta and add some Gaussian noise and that's the theta tilde, right? It's not, I don't think that that describes what's going on. There must be actually something that goes wrong for the designer to end up deviating from, from what they want. And we thought about this for a while. And we realized that what's going wrong is that as a designer, as an engineer, you can't possibly look at all the possible environments that the robot will ever be in and make sure that the reward you specify works everywhere. There's going to be edge cases. There's going to be stuff you haven't thought about. And what drives the suboptimality, what drives this difference between the theta that you want and the theta tilde that you specify um, is that you only look at some, what we're going to call a development set of environments, some, some training set of environments that you use to decide on the theta tilde. 
not, and that's not gonna be all of the possible environment. So to make this even more concrete, if you think about the boat case, right? The, the loopity boat racing thing. Um, usually what goes on, right? Is that you get surprised by this behavior um, um, because there's some fundamental difference between what we might call the development uh, set of environments and the deployment set. So we're not gonna worry about the boat acting weird during development time where you're still tuning up the reward function because if it acts weird then, you're gonna fix that and you're gonna, it's gonna be fine and then you're gonna go to deployment time. But we are gonna worry about being surprised by this behavior after you've deployed the robot, right? And if this happens, imagine that the boat loopity thing happened at deployment time. It didn't in the open AI case because it's just a lot. But imagine, let's, let's pretend like you actually made a boat and then you deployed it and then you, you know, all of a sudden it does this loopity thing, right? Basically it's faced with this new level in the game where you, it has to decide it can either win and get a lot of points, say 20,000, that's the stuff up top there, or it could do this loop, gain say 50,000 points, and then end up losing. And it decides to do the second um, over the first. Why? Because the designer specified score in the game as the, the reward function. And the interesting question is, well, why did they specify score in the game, right? Why didn't they just tell the boat what they want to do? Um, and, and assuming that, I mean, you know, there's also a lot of practical things that go in here. Maybe, you know, you can't define winning. Maybe winning is actually hard to optimize for. We're going to assume that, that we have good optimization. So it's not a problem of, oh, the, you know, there's some inability to optimize for something. We're going to assume that we live in a world where we got really good at optimizing for getting robots to optimize for the stuff we want. So then what must be the case is that when the person decided on score, they were looking at this development set of environment during development time. And in these environments, the boat's decisions look very different. In these environments, it must have been the case that the boat could either win with a lot of points, or if it got fewer points, it would lose. And so score and winning were correlated at development time, which made it seem like score was actually a really good reward function that would always actually lead to the behavior that you want, but that correlation was broken at deployment time. So that's what I mean by this is where the suboptimality in theta tilde comes from. That you might not be looking at everything, you might not be anticipating everything. So you'll end up with something that is reasonable, but it's reasonable given the development set. And that's really the key idea. The key idea here is that what we specify um, is not the same as the true reward. So we should not expect that the behavior induces everywhere is the right behavior. However, we do know for sure where it does induce good behavior. It induces good behavior on the environments that, you, that were used by the designer during the development time to tune and test the reward function. Whatever designer landed on as the specified reward, we know that that behavior that it incentivizes on those development environments is good, meaning what does it mean to be good? It has high true reward. It's good with respect to what they actually want. So we're gonna say that the behavior incentivized by the specified reward in development has high true reward, and we're gonna base our observation model on this idea. Um, another, a more, a more anthropomorphic way of saying this is that what we specify as people comes in a context. And the robot shouldn't interpret it literally, but should interpret it in that context. This applies to language, but it also applies to reward functions, we think. So this leads to this mathematical model where the probability of me writing down this theta tilde doesn't just de depend on theta star, the thing that I want, but it also depends on the development environment or environments that I'm looking at. And our model says that if you look at what behavior this theta tilde incentivizes in the development environment. So these are gonna be the trajectories that are optimal or approximately optimal with respect to the theta tilde. The lower, the, the, the higher the reward um, of those trajectories with respect to theta star, the more likely I am as the designer to write down that theta tilde as the specified reward. So that's what this model says. Um, if, if um, here's kind of a toy plot where I put the, all of the trajectories in the development environment on the x-axis 
pretending like that's a one-dimensional space. And we're plotting, in this case, the, I flipped it because I like costs, so it's the negative reward, okay? And what we're plotting here is um, a hypothetical theta star. This is, this, this, this is the, the reward induced by what the person would actually want. Um, what I want you to notice about this is two things. So number one is that according to this model, I am, it captures that I'm very likely to actually specify theta star. Theta star has high probability given theta star because um, theta star, when I optimize it, it gives me trajectories that theta star likes kind of by definition. So theta star is gonna have high probability. It's not like I'm not gonna specify theta star. But the trick is that there's other possible thetas and some of them I might specify, some of them not. So here's the theta that I won't specify according to this model. It would, this would have very low probability as becoming the theta tilde because when I optimize that on the development, it produces bad behavior respect to theta star. So this model captures that that's not, if, if, if I try that, I'll notice the bad behavior, I'll switch it. So that's not gonna be end, end up as being this task specification. However, there might be a number of different uh, cost functions or, or reward functions that do agree with theta star on this, on this development environment. So when I optimize them, I see good behavior and I might actually end up specifying those. And the problem occurs that then I use this at deployment time. If I didn't pick the theta star, I picked one of these other ones that agree. Now they might all of a sudden disagree and I might, might get into trouble. So, so that's, that's what this model is helping us capture. Um, on the boat case, uh, back to the boat. Here are the behaviors we were talking about on the development environment. So you could either win with a lot of points, lose with fewer points. Those are sort of the option score and winning were correlated. Um, and just for the pur purpose of understanding this model better, let's just say for now that the robot has access to many different possible features that it might, that might matter. So, so it has access to a notion of score, of whether it wins or not, and many more. We're gonna relax that assumption in a bit, but just for understanding, let's say that these are possible thetas that the, the robot is aware of and holding a belief over. So I told the robot, optimize theta two. That was the, the specified proxy. Uh, meaning maximize score. In a nominal world, the robot would just go off and maximize score everywhere. But what we're proposing is for the robot just something a little bit different. So um, what the robot does is it looks at the behavior that is induced in the development time um, uh, by, and remember the score and winning are correlated, when, I, when it optimizes for theta two, right? So this is the winning behavior with high score. That's, that's what happens at the development time. So then it asks, okay, which of these possible thetas in my hypothesis space of possible reward functions, which of these end up liking that behavior? And clearly theta two does. And clearly these other ones that minimize winning or minimize score don't. So we trust that the person didn't mean those because if they meant those, they wouldn't have liked that behavior, they would have fixed that. But what the robot figures out is that there's this other one, which is maximize winning, that is also consistent with that behavior. And so it's not, just to clarify, I'm not saying that the robot magically figures out that you want it to win. What I'm saying is the robot looks at you telling it to maximize score and understands that it's ambiguous whether what you actually want is for it to maximize score or for it to win. Um, so it has this, this ambiguity, this uncertainty over that. So it trusts some aspects of what you said, but not all aspects. That's what happens. Okay, so what do you do um, with this, right? You, the person specifies theta tilde, the robot does its belief update, and then you can plan an expectation uh, with respect to, to this. Uh, kind of hedge your bets. You can even do risk averse planning, right? Where you kind of protect against some notion of worst case. Um, we did this for, we tried this for motion planning. So we do a lot of motion planning for cars, but also for arms around people. And um, it's really gnarly to specify objectives, cost functions for trajectory optimization here. So um, there are all these different aspects of the task that are important, like you want to avoid collisions, you want to stay far enough away from fragile objects, like we have a base here in the simulation. Uh, you also want to maintain a comfortable distance from people. Um, so all of these aspects can end up contradicting each other, and there's a tension between them. And as designers, we implicitly might know what trade-offs should be in the sense we know what behavior we want to see, but it's really hard to tune that to capture exactly what you want. 
And so what do you do? You look at, um, and, and this is actually what uh, one of my students did. Um, he uh, looked at a bunch of different uh, environments that he created that he thought were representative. He tuned trade-offs that um, among these different features that would produce good behavior on all these environments. And then we started testing it on new environments. And it worked and it worked and it worked until it didn't. So here's an environment where it just plows through the vase. Now, could I have fixed that with hard constraints? In this case, yes, I could have fixed that with hard constraints, but I get into other problems, like you know, situations where you can't both not hit this and not stay you know, far away enough from the person. So, um, so, so this is what happens when you optimize the, the thing that we ended up specifying. And what we're saying here is, no, 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 let's actually take this data tilde, think about this development set of environments, do a belief update, get this uncertainty, and by the way, really gnarly to do this, this I, I'm talking about it theoretically, right? But in practice, what do we do? We use a lot of MCMC of various forms to approximate this. We look at trajectories that are optimal, locally optimal in various places. Um, so there's a lot of approximations that come in, just to clarify. So I'm kind of presenting here the very clean version. Um, but in practice, it's actually pretty difficult to do this, especially for continuous and somewhat high dimensional uh, reward spaces. So, okay, so the robot gets this posterior, and then actually we plan just an expectation, and you hedge your bets. So the robot ends up sort of with something that actually addresses this, this problem. Um, we also did this thing, I don't know how much time I want to spend on that, but we, we also do this thing where, because now the specified reward is only evidence about the, the reward that you want, you can go ahead and allow the engineer to specify different reward functions, different proxies for different environments or subset of environments, rather than asking them to tune one that is good for everything. So that simplifies their tasks a lot because they don't have to tune, tune, tune and play the whack-a-mole until it works. They can sort of do it independently. Um, and we saw that this um, decreases the time to specify a good reward, decreases the regret, um, and, and people said that it was easier to use. Okay, so this is all good news. Now on to the bad news, uh, things that are not working so great or things that we're currently, um, uh, that are work in progress for us. So um, a big limitation of these results is that we had so far very convenient access to the right features. So the, the, in the both case, we had magical access to a winning feature. So we could figure out the person might have meant winning. Um, we, in the motion planning case, we had access to all these different, um, the, you know, distances that might be important and play a role. So we started experimenting with the case where you don't um, have access to this in this simple grid world. Um, just, it's a kind of a toy task uh, in many ways. But we set up this grid world that has these cells of different types. So there's dirt, there's grass, there's goal locations. And then there's a dangerous surface for dramatic effect, I'll call this lava, okay? And what happens, um, what the, the gist of this is gonna be that we're gonna design a reward function that uh, on environments that do not have lava, and then we're gonna see what happens at test time when the robot encounters lava. So the key here that made it different from this other, other results that, um, that uh, I was sharing earlier is that the robot does not get access to what these features are, to the type of cell. So what we did is we made each cell emit some raw observations, and the robot got access to those raw observations only. So it has no notion of grass or lava or anything like that. It just has every cell, and it lands on a cell, there's observations coming from that cell. So that's kind of to emulate more, a slightly more realistic thing where you don't know the correct features. So the development set has no lava. The designer essentially writes classifiers to detect grass based on the raw observations, dirt, right? And completely forgets about lava because it's not present in the development. You don't think that you're gonna ship your robot to Hawaii and it has to traverse lava um, when you're making it in Berkeley. So lava is implicitly detectable in the raw observations, but the robot has no concept of that, doesn't have a classifier for it or anything like that. And then we run inference on the cost functions, the reward functions defined over these raw observations. And amazingly enough, risk-sensitive planning, so this is the risk-averse version, um, on the posterior, it avoids lava. So this means that it implicitly knows um, that it doesn't know whether lava is good or bad without knowing what lava is. 
And I find that very promising, but it's in a, you know, it's in a grid world. <laughs> so <laughs> your mileage might vary. But the nice thing is that um, uh, somehow it figures out it, and avoids these unintended consequences by risk averse planning, despite not actually having a concept of, oh, there's lava, and this is a thing that wasn't there at development time and so on. Uh, lava is just latent in the space. So, so, you know, I think I put this in limitations because I think there's signs of progress, but I don't know how to really scale this up. Um, the other thing that we're working on that is a problem is that if a lava were instead of pot of gold that you really wanted to get to, the robot also avoid it, right? Because anyone that's not present in, a, in the robot's decision-making space, doesn't have to be in the feature space, but any kind of new decision-making, it's gonna be conservative, right? So it's gonna avoid any new feature um, that, that it thinks you couldn't have accounted for during design time, and that's a problem. Um, so I think that, well, let me say this, we, we, we're also looking at this um, in the context of autonomous driving, where we have these, you train, you, not you train, you define a reward function based on some development set um, for some simple driving task. And then the robot can do this, this uh, uh, posterior, it can get this, um, it can do this belief update and get the posterior. And the car becomes very conservative because it hedges its best along all these different things. Um, and so we don't want that. And so I think planning, doing risk averse planning kind of only makes sense if you assume that you can't get any more information ever, that you're stuck with the belief that you have and that's it, right? But in reality, what we're trying to build towards is an actual collaboration between the designer and the robot. An actual, you know, a kind of, I think this is a human robot interaction problem. I can't help it. I see the world through the lens of human robot interaction, but, but I think there should be an interaction. And so I think that the robot should take into account the iterative nature of a reward design and not, you know, just take the current information it got and assume, okay, th this is it. I don't, there's no more future observations. There are future observations. And in particular, the robot that thinks of it through this lens can actually take control of what those future observations are and essentially go back to the designer and, and use its posterior and essentially search for environments where probable, high probability rewards end up actually contradicting, right? And we, the way we formalize this is by searching for environments that maximize expected info gain. And so what this does is the robot takes your, your proxy, computes this posterior, and then comes back to you with an environment that it's like, I don't know what to do here. You told me to do this. Are you sure that this is what you want? Because there's these other things that I could do that seem also consistent. Um, I really love this um, ba because basically it, I don't want to oversell it, but it, it's, you can kind of think of it as finding these edge case environments where edge case means it, if you optimize your proxy, you'll perform poorly with respect to the true reward. So there's these environments where the proxy doesn't work. Um, and you see that in this graph, higher regret um, on, the uh, on the proposed environment uh, with respect to the true reward. Um, and then what this leads to is essentially um, better, just better reward functions at the end of the day. So this is a graph that shows if you just use the proxy over time and the person sees environments as they come and fixes the proxy, this is what happens when you run this, this um, what we call inverse reward design. So this, this process where the robot takes a posterior and looks at the posterior and plans an expectation, um, or, or risk averse, this was actually just using the, uh, the map uh, of that. And then this is what happens when you do this active thing, where you're suggesting environments for the person to look at. And you see that this is regret on a test, held out test set of tasks, where the, the, you, you end up improving um, much faster, rather than exposing the person to kind of environments as they come. Good, how are we doing on time? Uh, maybe five more minutes. Okay, so the, the final limitation that I really don't know how to get around is that when we parameterize the reward function, right? We choose some parameterization. And I think there's a spectrum of where that lies. You can end up, on the one hand, you can have just define some features yourself and linear weights on that. On the other hand, you can say it's a neural network. Um, and anything in between. And so the capacity of your model matters a lot here because if I just do linear, linear combination of features like we were doing in motion planning, that still helps 
but I'm not going to discover like lava, right? Because I only have access to the features I have. If I do neural nets, I can express any reward function almost, um, depending on the, the uh, architecture that you're choosing. But the problem is that you can express too much. So you're going to have too many hypotheses that are consistent. And so you're going to have to interact with the person, you know, for the age of the universe to figure out what it is that, that they want. I don't know how to solve this. I think this just, it seems like a pretty fundamental issue. Okay, so starting to kind of pop up. So we've talked about how specified rewards can be seen as evidence about what people actually want the robot to optimize for. Um, now, how might we actually generalize this to everything else, right? Because in the beginning of the talk, we talked about, well, I push the robot, I turn it off, I say stuff to it, there's a house of cards. The robot should learn from all of this, right? How do we do that? Um, and here I want to take a step back and talk about two types of feedback that I haven't mentioned yet that are very well established and we know exactly what to do for. So one type of feedback is comparisons. Here, the idea is the robot will show you two trajectories, A or B, right? Um, Rachel's laughing, I see her, because she's worked on this. Um, so, so A or B, and then the person chooses which one is better. And you learn from that. How do you learn from that? We have an observation model for this. So, um, and this is pretty well understood. So the way we learn from that is we think of it as the person making a choice with respect to the reward function. Um, we think of they have these two choices, psi A and psi B, and they make a choice, A or B, based on the reward, cumulative reward of that choice. And they're not perfect. So there's this loose model, loose axiom of choice that was then adapted by Shepard that basically says people pick right in proportion to the exponent of the cumulative reward. And what I want you to pay attention to here is just this um, normalizing term, right? So you, you normalize this distribution over psi A and psi B, the two choices you have. So that's one thing where we have probability of, of feedback given, given theta. There's another place where we have probability of feedback given theta, which is inverse reinforcement learning. So here, the person gives you a trajectory demonstration. They tell you what to do in that particular environment. And, um, and one way to see inverse reinforcement learning, especially Bayesian inverse reinforcement learning, uh, but I would argue every, pretty much every type, is that the person is making a choice as well. But it's not an explicit choice anymore. It's not like here are you know, infinitely many trajectories, pick one. It's implicit, right? The space of trajectories is sort of in their head, and they're choosing one of all the possible trajectories. So they're making a choice. It's psi d as opposed to all these other trajectories that they could have demonstrated. And they're also choosing with respect to the cumulative reward. And the model is pretty much the same thing, except now we're normalizing over all the possible trajectories. So those are two cases where we know what to do. There's a third case where we know what to do, which we just talked about, which is when the person specifies a reward function, right? So this was the observation model we built just now in the talk for rewards. So that's also a choice. So there's, uh, and I apologize, if you hear some banging, it's, 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 my, it's my fault. There's construction happening on my house <laughs> that I have relatively limited control over. <laughs> and so when the person specifies a uh, uh, proxy reward, they're making a choice. Now the choice is no longer among trajectories. The choice is among different proxy rewards that they could have specified but didn't. And so, you know, what does it mean? Do they, you know, do they pick with respect to the reward function? What's the reward of a proxy reward? Well, that's a syntax mismatch, but they, what they pick with respect to is the, you take this specified reward and it induces behavior in the development set and they pick with respect to the reward of that, those behaviors. So, and they compare that with other proxies that they could specify, right? So that's the choice that they're making. And it's, I think if you put it all together, I'd say that in all of these three situations, what we're modeling the person is doing is this reward, rational, often implicit choice. The choices with respect to the reward, but we have to kind of ground their choice, which is not all the time a robot behavior into robot behaviors first in order to evaluate the reward on that. So their choice is C, the person is picking, um, based on the reward of the behavior induced by these choices. So we have a little grounding function there, which I, I, we took inspiration from language where it's literally grounding into the behavior.
Okay, so going back to this question, we have all these different types of feedback, right? Pushes, off switch, house of cards. How do you make sense of all of it? Well, maybe we can think of any type of feedback as actually a reward rational implicit choice that the person is making. And so that's what we do for pushes. Um, there are the choices among different external torques that you could apply to the robot. You chose one of them, right? And then you map that into these, you either, you either compute the, the total torque and you think about the Q value of that as an action, or you map that into a deformation of the trajectory. And you, now you say, well, that deformed trajectory is better than the original trajectory. So that's what we do here. So now I push and lo and behold, the robot doesn't stubbornly go back but it runs this belief update. Well, it's not a full belief update. We just do the maximum likelihood estimate here. And then actually carries the thing closer to the ground. Success. Um, what about for off switch? Um, and I realized that it's here, so I'll talk for two more minutes and, I'll, and then I'll shut up, I promise. So for the off switch, um, if the, you, you press the button, right, the choice is you implicitly decided to not, to not do nothing, right? You actually press the button. So your choice was press the button, or don't, um, do not intervene. And you can map that to behavior, um, right? If you don't do anything, if you don't push the button, the robot continues along its planned trajectory. If you do stop it, then that maps the trajectory where it did what it did so far, and then it just stopped for the rest of the time horizon. So that's a comparison that the person is giving you on trajectories as well. House of cards, uh, like save the best for last. So we've talked about, right, actually observing human behavior of some sort. Um, so if I have a person and there's a vase in the middle, if I see the person go around the vase, I can figure out that they want to not break the vase, right? Okay, so that's like something that we can do with, with any of these types of feedbacks. Okay, the thing is, what if I don't see the person? I just entered the room and there's a vase there. How come the vase is still there despite the fact that it wasn't, you know, the beginning of the universe? The existence of the vase is information that the person must actually care about not breaking the vase, even though the person did not, might have not said that at all. So the environment itself leaks information. That's sort of the house of cards example as well. Um, how do we interpret that? Reward rational implicit choice. So we think of the state of the world as being a choice that the person is making, a choice between what? Between possible states. What behavior does a state correspond to? a state of the world where the person has been acting in that environment in order to lead to that state at zero. So we're going to map that to all behaviors that the person could have done that end up in that state. And that's the choice. It's based on the reward of those behaviors versus the reward of behaviors that end in different states. And so you now you know something about the, the, the reward function. OK, so what basically what this does is it says, here's the state. What is this consistent with? Well, if the person wanted to break the vase, they would have gone through and I would have seen the vase broken. That's not consistent with what I'm seeing. If the person didn't care about the vase, they also would have gone through because efficiency, I would have seen the vase broken. So if the person actually cared about not breaking the vase, right, they would have gone around. That's the thing that's consistent with what I'm seeing. And so that's how the robot can actually figure out that a person must care about not breaking the vase. Um, okay, so in, if you tell the robot, go to that exit, it actually goes around as opposed to breaking the vase. That's really cute. Even cuter is that the robot figures out useful things to do, not just what not to do. So I really like this, this little toy example. So here we have a train running. And the train is running, and the robot figures out, man, this train is still running. Then, you know, that must mean that someone kept fitting it the batteries so that it keeps on running. So it doesn't just go to the door, it first picks up the battery, reloads in and then goes, to the, goes through the door because it could infer from the fact that the train is running that people must care about having it. Okay, so these are all kind of desirable side effects. Good, so to wrap up, I think we should try to get these robots to optimize for what we want rather than what we specify. Those are not the same. I think you can think of all these different sources of, of information, of human feedback as these choices that people make implicitly and that's almost like a recipe for making sense formally of these of these this information and actually being able to have robots learn from it 
Um, if you do that, then you don't overlearn from specified rewards and you don't leave this other information on the table. Of course, you know, we do a lot of work on how it's not quite rational. Like I question the word rational or even noisy rational. So we do also a lot of work on fixing that and making more realistic assumptions about the person. Um, I think this is a problem in general, even though I talked about rewards, again, you know, constraints, et cetera, would suffer from similar things. And, and the same ideas apply that what human feedback gives you evidence about the parameters you have in there. Um, and I think this can help us go, I think this, this essentially fits in this larger agenda that we've been pursuing where it's not like you specify a thing and then the robot optimizes it, but the, the human and the robot are part of this collaborative interaction um, that is not even just train and then, and then a, there's a test time, but you're actually acting together. And as you're acting together, you're trying to collaborate towards the, the robot actually doing um, what you want. So the robot acts to gather information, the person tries to be informative and they're actually acting in the same space. That's what we call assistance games. So um, that's a little bit about what we've been up to lately. I just wanna acknowledge the students and the faculty collaborators involved in that. And thank you very much for listening. And I'll stop sharing. Excellent. Um, thank you very much, Anka. That was a fantastic talk. Um, thanks for a great discussion on um, rewards and um, um, how do we as robot programmers or robot um, collaborators or robot observers, we get to specify our intent of what we want them to do. Um, something that has come to dominate so much of uh, the research in, uh, in the robotics community. Um, and we're moving now to the panel discussion. Um, for everyone in the audience, remember that you can write your questions or vote on your questions at the uh, roboticstoday.github.io uh, website. Uh, there's an interface there to do it. And um, uh, to move into the panel discussion, I'd like to welcome uh, Ayana Howard. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today as our guest uh, expert panelist. Uh, coming from, joining from Atlanta, I think. Um, uh, Ayana, she is the chair of the interactive computing at the College of Computing at Georgia Tech and also the director of the Human Automation Systems Lab. So Ayana, Anka is all yours. Yes, um, so I'm gonna ask two questions and I was given permission that I can ask the spicy ones. Oh. Uh, so I will. So the one is, um, as you know, I work on over trust and bias quite a bit with, with respect to robotics. Um, and in your talk, you really focused on the developer and them putting in the rewards and even the system itself, you know, with uncertainty matching that. But, you know, as developers, as roboticists, we have so many biases. I would say we don't represent the rest of the world. Yeah. So how would you think about modifying your algorithm so that, as a roboticist, I mean, we want to help people, but how do we do it so that our technology, even if it's from a developer mindset, is really making sense so that the users can impact and provide their inferred rewards and things like that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for that question. I think it's a really important one. And uh, I think, so, so let me say, let me make two comments on this. The first one is that um, one thing that I haven't discussed in my talk is who's the human providing this. And of course, specified rewards, we expect that developers uh, uh, are, are, can provide and not end users. Um, but we do a lot of all this other feedback types. They're sort of geared towards the end user being able to go in and adjust what it is that they, that they want. And so if you think back to the example of me pushing the arms, the thought there was maybe I have a developer and the developer um, uh, forgot some things because the developer can't know everything. And I think you can think of this from two perspectives. One is that there are things that they don't, they just, they know, but they didn't think about, or there's things that they, um, they just don't know because, because, you know, the robot should do what the person wants maybe, or some, maybe some combination. And so we think of, you know, all these different types of feedback. You walk into a room, what does the person's environment tell you? The person physically pushes on you or, you know, panics and switches you off or something like that. They speak, um, 
what can you do to refine the, your, your understanding of the reward function to personalize to that individual? That, but I think that, that I'm sweeping something under the rug because I think this assumes that you kind of go into the interaction with the person having a, a prior from over the, over the reward from the developer and you refine that into a posterior based on the uh, interaction with the specific person. Um, but there's, I think, you know, your question was really interesting because what if the, what if there's something just fundamentally flawed about the, the developer, you know, maybe it's not a good idea to go in with that, with that as a prior. So, so um, one thing that, I mean, if, if there's things you could do, you could sort of get the data from a lot of people and end up with a prior based on that rather than based on the developer. But I do think a little bit about what is the role of the developer and what is the role of the end user. And I don't have a great answer to that um right so i don't want the, the autonomous car to do only what what the person wants because the autonomous there's multiple stakeholders right there's there's the there the developer has some responsibility so you can't just you know let the car adapt willy-nilly to everything the end user needs to be comfortable there's multiple end users riding in a car and there's everyone around who we need to actually we also have responsibility to them so how do you bring all of that together something that we just you know, we have one paper on this topic, but that's about it. I think it's a very open area. So I'm sorry that was very long-winded, but that's the first comment. The second comment is going to be very quick, which is that the when it comes to notions of, say, fairness or, um, no, you know, not wanting to change, if I'm a recommender system, not wanting to change the, the person's preferences and kind of manipulate them, right? These, these very sticky issues, I think that the way I see this work kind of helping a little bit towards those very big issues is just that it's very hard to write down in code or in math a metric for fairness or a metric for, you know, don't manipulate the user. And I think that developers can have all the best intentions, but they fail at writing that down properly. And I think these interactive tools that actually interact with the developer to expose them to say, okay, here's what I would do based on the metric that you've currently tried in this situation. Are you sure that that's what you mean by fairness? I, you know, I'm very excited about using these kinds of tools in that context. So thank you for that. Nice. Um, one more question. So you work in both the simulation and in the physical hardware space. Um, and as you know, there's always this conflict between um, more AI folks who work on toy problems, beautiful math, and the other, which is core robotics who work on real hardware, right? So there's always been, been this battle. Um, you play in both fields. And so can you really enlighten us about the pain of working in hardware versus in the simulation, just so that you know, with you're very rare in this, and so really letting people know um, how far both are. Yeah, um, I will. I I'll be just brutally honest. So, a lot of the times, I find that it's harder to recruit students and get them interested in the physical side because it's so much harder to do the physical side. Um, so I'm frustrated at myself in a lot of in a lot of a lot of these papers that we write. I mean, there you know, there's beautiful math theory, like you said, and then you see like some results in grid worlds, right? Um, and I and I try I try to push them towards okay, maybe a fancier simulation that's more you know realistic, a little bit closer to to real life. But but it, it, it it's hard. You kind of it's hard to set incentives for for the students. So that's good, just very brutally honest answer. The other. The other aspect of this is um, uh, the the very real trade off we have to make as researchers between um, you know the, the the kind of the fundamental idea versus versus the intricacies of continuous high dimensional state and action spaces. I think this is one, um, I, I, you know, I think you can do in simulation stuff where you don't know the dynamics and you don't, you know, there's, there's, you can, you can make assumptions, you can loosen your, relax your assumptions in simulation as well. It's not the same because uh, we don't have great simulators, uh, but, but, or we know too much, but, um, but the part that really is that I personally struggle with is it takes so much work to take an idea, you know, in my slides, I just showed Bayesian updates, right? As if they just work, as if that's, that's what you do. <laughs> Push external torque, yeah, map that into a thing, done. It takes so much work to derive approximations 
that actually work in real time in continuous state and action. So every time you see one of our papers where we actually put it on a robot, and actually I'll actually put autonomous cars into that, even though we do that in simulation. Um, we don't have a real car at Berkeley. We sometimes have play with RC cars, but um, you know, even that, it's it's continuous state and action, it's actual dynamics, and uh, you want to solve general sum games. And and you know, if I were like in a little matrix game, done. But but there's so much that needs to go and figuring out. I'm trying to solve this in really intense problem. And, you know, I can't just throw a palm DP solver at it, clearly. So what, or I can't just throw a game solver at it. I can't do dynamic programming. So what do I do? Like, how do I structure my approximation so that they end up exhibiting the, the properties of the behavior that I want if I were to actually be able to solve that problem, but be able to run on board? I think that's how much effort you spend on that versus how much effort you spend on, you know, the, the principles and the ideas and the theory uh, uh, itself. Always this balance that I don't, I think I do a great job striking, but I try. Thank you, Anka. Great talk. I, I will uh, see you to the rest of the panelists. Thank you, Ayana. Um, feel free to jump in at any time and uh, we should we should make sure that Anka is answering the questions. Uh, so we should, if, if she uh, deflects at some point, we should just jump in. Uh, I <laughs> just kidding. Uh, so it looks like there's quite a lot of questions coming in uh, through the interface. So uh, Jingnan, uh, Rachel, and Nima, they're going to start uh, channeling those in. Um, I think Jingnan is going first. Uh, yes, uh, Anka, thank you for your great talk. So I have a question that relates to, to the second part of the future work you discussed. Uh, basically, uh, I was wondering, have you considered uh, taking adversarial environments into account? And then one example I can think of is uh, for autonomous vehicles, uh, if they encounter hostile drivers on the road, um, how would you expect uh, the system and theory you described to adapt to those situations. Thank you. Yeah, that's a that's a, a great question. And here, so we did a little bit of work that the word that I mentioned was on the environment, and then there's a question of the behavior of the humans in that environment, which you were getting at, um, and optimizing. So we did uh, with with Dorsa, we did some comparison-based learning work where we were actually synthesizing not just the environment but the but the behavior of the human um, in order to to be as informative as possible to the robot. Uh, so not necessarily to test against adversarial cases, but to gather. Uh, to, to gather a lot of information, right? So if the human kind of just stays into their lane and doesn't interact with the robot, it's not going to be very informative. And so, so that that was you know the most related thing I can think of. Um, there's this what you raised kind of is a I think a bigger philosophical thing where you can have people, you can simulate people, for instance, as playing a zero sum game with the car, um, but that's not going to be very useful because because then you end up with cars that hedge against the worst case. So uh, my colleague uh, Claire Tomlin works on this reachability uh, analysis tools. And so you can compute this forward reachable set. And then you can say, I'm going to stay out of the forward reachable set at all times. And that just means you can't leave the garage, right? I think many people have said stuff like this. That And so, so Claire and I, are, I have this, this um, uh, really nice collaboration on, on trying to go in between the world where we model people as, you know, noisy, rational, we know what's up with them, and the world where we use uh, four reachable sets and protect against, you know, people as disturbances, as, as adversaries. Kind of what, what is a bridge that maintains safety to a certain extent, but but gets the car out the door, so to say. Okay. Actually, I have a follow-up question about these, so, um, which definitely applies to the adversarial setup, but also to other setups, I would say. And um, I imagine that sometimes, like, you know, because of the feedback uh, from the human, sometimes the system can become unstable, right? So the feedback becomes like open loop, and, uh, you know, the human is aggressive, the robot becomes more aggressive, and things uh, keep escalating. 
So do we understand, like, you know, can we use like game theoretic results in which we understand when this is going to converge and when this is going to converge to a reasonable result? Um, yeah, I think one, um, one approach that we're, that we're, is very much currently under investigation um, is my student, uh, Andrea Baikshi, is working on um, essentially using this, this thinking of this from a reachability framework. So being able to say, okay, this is what we start with this belief over, over theta. And what, you know, what could possible human inputs lead us to, to lead this belief to become? So it's like a reachability problem defined over the belief, really hard to, to compute, right? But you, you're doing this analysis offline as a way to actually analyze your predictor. Um, and so it's, it's sort of okay from that perspective. So we're able to actually, we had a little bit of this in our, our ICAR paper this year, but we're able to answer questions like, if I start with you know, thinking that the person has this goal and I'm pretty convinced, in the best case and in the worst case, how long will it take me to come to the realization, to shift enough probability mass on, on away from that goal and figure out what the person is actually doing. So we solve this, these problems by, by solving a reachability problem on their, um, over the, the state being the physical space and the belief over data. Good, thank you. All right, thank you for the great talk. Um, so we had a great question from Veach. He asked, can learning the intended reward give the robot a certain sense of morality in an environment? And maybe we can extend this question to say, can this, these frameworks address questions of ethics and morality? And these a little bit more abstract. These abstract questions, yeah. Um, and this is a little bit part of what my answer to Ayana too was that um, we the last the, the very last slide was in this notion of assistance games, right? So um, this this formulation of the problem where yes, there's a theta in the person's head implicitly. There's the robot will have a belief over theta. The human and the robot are working together to maximize, to try to maximize that reward, but the robot doesn't know what it is. And, and you, you're getting this, you know, these, the, the robot reading into the information from the human. The human tries to be pedagogical. The robot tries to gather information and do things, even physical actions. Like, you know, we do things like a robot hands you off some stuff and, and it does that in a way that makes you respond in a very informative way that enables it to figure out what's comfortable for you. Um, and, and so we use that, we think of that framework in collaborations with, um, with uh, Stuart Russell and our student uh, uh, Dylan Hattie-Menel, we're thinking of that as a formalization for what we sometimes call the value alignment problem. So I talked about it in my talk from this very robotics perspective. This is a robotics talk, right? So we, we, I, I've tried to share examples of you know, real struggles in designing reward functions for robots and how this kind of framework can help actually alleviate those struggles. But we also, you know, there's this kind of other part of my brain that thinks about it from the perspective of it's really hard to figure out what people really want. It's really hard to figure out, to, to prevent unintended consequences of getting really good at optimization, reinforcement learning, et cetera. And I'm not too worried that will happen very soon, but you know, getting good at that stuff and then having over-optimizing for the specified objective and the, the, having these unintended consequences down the line. Um, and, and, and so we think about that framework as, as kind of formalizing the problem of aligning aligning the, the robot's kind of objective with what the person actually wants um, and, 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 and addressing these issues of frame conditions of things that you forget, you don't think about, right? So, um, and addressing, helping address issues like, I don't know what the fairness metric is. So, so you know, help me iterate on that and, and get me to something that actually better matches my kind of internal notion of, of that. Even if I'm, you know, I'm a moral philosopher and, and I can like try to write something down, but I, I'm flawed because I'm still a human. I'm not a moral philosopher, just to clarify. I was, I, was, I was using the royal eye or whatever it's called. Thanks. Hey, Anga. Um, there are two questions from the audience that are kind of intertwined uh, from Ruth and Anonymous. Um, 
That is, you mentioned that a person may leak information by doing something. Um, but what if they leak information by not doing, not something? doing something? Yeah. And I think an example is like, what if I didn't touch the vase because I don't want to deal with it, but I want the robot to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right. So the, the best example of this is probably when I don't intervene, right? So all the times where I don't push the robot, all the times where I'm not actually um, you know, hitting the stop button. I don't say anything to the robot. I just don't get in, in its way. Um, and and all, all of those are, are choices, right? I could choose to do that, but I just don't. Um, and so it, it gives the robot information that everything must be at least going, you know, well enough that the cost of me intervening, I find that, you know, higher than, than correcting whatever suboptimality the robot has. Um, this, the, the reason it's, so we don't actually use that kind of feedback. Um, we don't actually in the work, in all the work that I've described so far, the off, the pushes, we only do a belief update when we actually receive information. We don't interpret the lack of information as evidence, uh, even though we should. And the reason, um, for this is that the grounding becomes really tricky. So the grounding of, I didn't hit the off button is uh, really should be not what the robot plans on doing, but what the person thinks the robot plans on doing. So the person's expectation, right? And so I'm heading towards the water. I plan on going through the water all along, but the person only intervenes when it becomes obvious to them that that's what I'm doing. That's just a little harder to, to, to model and to ground. And so that's why we don't do that. But um, the, the question answers are absolutely right that that in ideal world we would, because there is information there. I have a question from Korosh. So uh, the question is, can you share with us your experience with the tasks that, uh, that have partial observability and uncertainty in perception? Mm. Well, so all tasks have partial observability and uncertainty because you don't know theta. <laughs> so theta is part of the state and it's hidden and you can't use observations about it. Um, and because of that, um, and because it, you know, it's, it's so hard to deal with that, we tend to cheat and just you know, assume perception away. Um, so when we, do, when we do cars, we get to, to see the, where the other car is exactly. There's no, there's no perception issues. When we do quarters navigating around people, we put mocap markers on them. Um, and uh, and you know, there's, uh, th that's how we deal with the perception issue. And of course that's not realistic. Um, and, and it's a big limitation of the work that we do. Um, it's just, we, we kind of took a bit of this divide and conquer because if I already have partial observability from all this other stuff, then it, uh, it's just, it's, it's overwhelming, right? You can, you kind of have to break it up and, and tackle the piece that, that you want. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, 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 my students are currently working on actually for the navigation stack, being able to, to, to deal with, um, uh, sensors, either infrared or we're thinking about LIDAR too. And um, what that does to the, to the controller because you're trying to estimate these things, but you have to be able to observe them first, right? So if I am trying to figure out your goal, but you're not in my field of view right now, <laughs> then that's a problem. And now I have to, you know, make th these typical trade-offs, right? Between like actually getting my desk done, operating on the information that I have versus actually kind of getting out of my way to turn to look towards you to see what you're up to, which might deviate from what I currently think is best, but might help me a lot uh, with once I gain that information. So um, we're, 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 we're trying to tackle some of those issues, but it's very limited so far. Um, I'll jump in quickly. Um, you mentioned that uh, we don't observe theta. And um, in, in your slides, you use theta um, all the time, which um, gives us a sense that there is some form of parameter, there's some parametric form of the reward over which you're optimizing. Um, yeah. Is that in practice what happens? Uh, is that does that have to be always the case? Is there another way to include like a bias? Um, 
Can you elaborate on that? What do you mean by a uh, way to include a bias? Like um, I, as a designer, have to specify what is the family of rewards mm -hmm. over which we you will sort of optimize mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. Is there also a non-parametric form for this theory? Um, yeah, I mean, you can, you, you could, you could do, um, uh, you could represent the reward as a GP, and that would be uh, an alternative that would work just fine. Um, and and one interesting thing about your question is that you can choose a very flexible um, hyperparametric form for theta if you wish, right? So you can have like a giant neural net that you stick in there and that's the, that's the reward. And that doesn't mean that that's the parametrization that the person is operating with. So I sort of, I didn't touch on this at all, but I kind of talked about theta tilde and theta coming from the same space. Uh, but they don't have to be, right? So you can have people that sort of build up their own kind of interpretable um, reward specification or task specification, and then you run your inference in a more elaborate space that is defined maybe on the, the, the raw state or the raw observations. That is something that you can do. Um, and that's what we did with the lava thing too. So, um, so you know, we but it was cheating because we was in simulation in you know, like a little toy thing, and the raw observations were Gaussians about whatever. Uh, but <laughs> but but um, so it worked there, but uh, it was a very shallow reward uh, defined on raw observations. And and then I mentioned I had this one slide on. You can have linear all the way to giant neural net, and there's a huge trade off there. So I. Don't know how to get around that, but yeah, to, to your point, directly, Alberto, you can parameterize the space that you're running inference over pretty kind of generously if if you think that that's the right thing to do, and then let the person do specification in whatever space they're comfortable with. Cool, thank you. Um, I think we're running out of time, so we're going to leave it here. Thank you very much, Anka and Ayana, for making the time, uh, and uh, everyone else for listening. Um, it was great. Uh, next week, we will uh, take a break and we'll come back on June 26 with uh, Scott uh, Quindersma, who will talk about his work uh, with humanoids and atlas from Boston Dynamics. And um, with that, we find that we all find um, ways to stay healthy and to stay hopeful uh, through these days. Thank you very much. <laughs>